Jeff Clawa. I serve as Chief Curatorial Officer here at Museum of the Bible, and I thank you for coming and uh, uh, engaging with the Bible uh, here tonight with a very special Bible, uh, with a very special presenter, uh, Professor uh, David Stern from Harvard. Um, if I could uh, invite you back to the museum, if you've not been here before, we'd love to welcome you back to tour the exhibits and see all the things we have on display. Uh, the exhibit itself, if you have not yet had a chance to see the Pentateuch face-to-face, uh, -face, the exhibit will be open until 9 o'clock tonight, and you can go down, uh, take the elevators, follow uh, the staff, and you go down to B1 to see the uh, exhibit tonight. Uh, if I could take just a moment uh, to thank our team on this one. Uh, this is probably, even though it's a very simple exhibit with one artifact, it might be the most complicated project we've done uh, between researching the artifact, uh, designing the exhibit, uh, the installation, the website, uh, the PR, uh, the event tonight, uh, the IT team to get the manuscript posted online, which you can see on our website tomorrow. The full manuscript will be online tomorrow. So I do want to thank our team, and uh, uh, thanks for all your hard work on this one. A great project. Thank you. And a special thanks to uh, one of our co-curators on the exhibit, uh, Herschel Hepler, who could not be here tonight because his wife is about to give birth. So he, uh, he made a better choice, I think, uh, but uh, deserves much of the credit for the, uh, the content of the exhibit. So thanks, Herschel. So my job really is just to welcome you and to introduce our other co-curator on the exhibit, um, Dr. Jared Wolf. Uh, Dr. Wolf received his PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Cultures from the University of California, UCLA. He served as a co curator here at the museum and editor for the last four years. And he's contributed significantly to this exhibit and other projects here at the museum. Please welcome Dr. Wolf. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, let, me all well, let me welcome all of you uh, again, extend a good evening to each of you. We're very, very uh, happy that you are here to, uh, to uh, really experience and engage with this unique Bible. Um, I'm here to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, I'm very happy to do so. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, uh, this is uh, Professor David Stern of Harvard University. Uh, Professor Stern is the Harry Starr Professor of Classical and Modern Hebrew and Jewish Literature and the Director of Harvard Center for Jewish Studies. He's written or edited 14 books, including Parables in Midrash, Narrative and Exegesis in Rabbinic Literature, um, Rabbinic Fantasies, Imaginative Narratives from Classical Hebrew Literature, and The Jewish Bible, A Material History. For this last, he received the 2018 Jordan Schnitzer Award for the best book in Jews and the Arts from the, Jewish, uh, from the Association for Jewish Studies. Professor Stern joined the Harvard faculty in 2015 after teaching for 31 years at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he is a recipient of many fellowships and awards and has also served as a visiting professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, at Princeton, the University of Washington, and Nanjing University. This evening, Professor Stern is going to speak to us about uh, the Washington Pentateuch and enlighten us on the Jewish scribes who created it and other iconic Hebrew Bible manuscripts. So without further ado, please join me in warmly inviting Professor Stern to the stage. Thank you, Jared, for the nice introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming out this night. Um, <clears throat> I want to begin first by thanking the Museum of the Bible, Jeff Kloha, Herschel Hepler, and the entire staff who've worked to make my consulting and visit so enjoyable, and for inviting me to work on this exhibit and deliver this lecture. It's a great honor to be asked to work on a Bible like the Washington Pentateuch. It's really a privilege. Such books do not fall into a scholar's lap every day. The Washington Pentateuch is the oldest Hebrew Bible in the possession of a public collection in America. It's an extremely important manuscript for reasons I'll explain in the course of this talk. 
And I want to congratulate the Museum of the Bible on acquiring it and especially on making it accessible to the public, both to scholars and to laypersons. This is no small thing. <clears throat> The Washington Pentateuch is one of a group of Hebrew biblical books that were produced in the Near East and North Africa, that is Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and Tunisia, between the early 10th and mid 11th centuries. This group includes one complete text of the Hebrew Bible and a number of volumes containing either the Pentateuch or large sections of the prophets and the hagiographa, the writings. All in all, 21 separate data works are represented, eight or nine other manuscripts without colophons. A colophon is usually a paragraph at the end of the work in which the scribe cites, mentions, states his own name, often the date when the work was written, often the patron, and the place where it was written. So there's eight or nine other manuscripts without these colophons, and therefore without dates, and hundreds of leaves representing lost works. As we'll see, the Washington Pentateuch in its present form is a composite book consisting of sections from different works. And while its main section, <clears throat> the brunt of the volume and its oldest part lacks a colophon and is therefore not datable, scholars believe that, sections were, that that section was probably composed around the year 1000, possibly in Tiberias or elsewhere in the land of Israel. Now, this entire group of early biblical books all share a more or less identical page layout. This is a typical text page from the Washington Pentateuch. And here are comparable text pages from the two most famous of these early, of other early biblical codices. First, the Aleppo Codex, written in the land of Israel, probably in Tiberias in 920, and the Leningrad Codex, written in Cairo in 1008. Now of the three, as you can see, the Washington Pentateuch is the largest. It's also the most square-like in shape. But the similarities between all three are obvious to you, particularly in terms of their page format. This page format is unprecedented in Jewish literature. There's nothing like it. And it's one reason for the importance of these books, as I'll explain. But before I turn to this format, let me speak briefly about the other reasons why these books are so important. To begin, these books represent the very first codices in the history of Hebrew literature, and to the best of our knowledge, the first codices produced by Jewish scribes. Now, codex is a scholarly term for what everybody else calls a book. And here on the screen, is a diagram of how a codex is produced. You take a sheet of writing material, papyrus, parchment, paper. You fold it first in half, and if you wish, then again, or even a third time, depending on what size you actually want the final page to be. And then the folds are cut to form a small booklet. Each of these small booklets is called a gathering or a choir. They usually consist of four to eight sheets or leafs or folios, thus producing eight to 16 pages, each page being a separate side of a folio. Then these gatherings required, these booklets, are then piled one atop another. They're sewn together at the spine and covered with a protective binding, and presto, you have a codex. And because of this structure, the codex is probably the most durable book form in the history of the book. But you should note that not all books are codices. Paperbacks, for example, are just sheets of paper glued together at the spine, and that explains why they fall apart as soon as you bend the spine. Now, the codex first emerged as a book form in the West around the year zero, at the turn of the Common Era, and the scroll and the codex coexisted for several centuries. This is the famous wall painting from Pompeii, which depicts the husband of a couple holding a scroll, probably his copy of Homer, and his wife holding a wax or wooden tablet, one of the earliest forms of the codex, possibly containing a grocery list or a romance novel. 
All in all, it took around 400 years for the Codex to surpass the scroll. Different reasons are cited for the eventual triumph of the Codex, that it's easier to navigate and to move back and forth in, or that it's more portable and comfortably handled than a scroll. But the most obvious reason is that it was twice as economical as a scroll, since in a Codex, you can write on both sides of the sheet, while in a scroll, only the inner side is typically inscribed, while the outer side is left blank in order to protect the inner side. As a result, the same number of sheets in a codex will contain twice as much text as a scroll. This is the most likely reason for the codex's triumph. Now, by the year 400, the codex had become the preferred writing platform for virtually everyone in the West, with the exception of one group of people, the Jews. Jews did not begin to write in codices until at the earliest, the seventh or eighth century, and the surviving biblical codices, like the Washington Pentateuch, are our first hard evidence for this fact. Exactly why Jews did not take up the codex for nearly 400 years, after everyone else, and whether they're not taking it up had a special meaning, and whether or not, for example, the Jewish refusal of the Codex was a, was a deliberate act of resistance to the writing form, all these questions have been the subject of much scholarly debate that remains inconclusive. For the present, we can say first that the only text normatively written down in ancient rabbinic Jewish tradition was the Bible, the Pentateuch in particular, and the, the Pentateuch in particular must be inscribed in a Sefer Torah, a Torah scroll written according to all the halachic or legal prescriptions of the rabbis. It therefore could never be written in a codex. As for the rest of rabbinic literature known as the oral Torah, this literature was, as its name indicates, at least publicly and formally transmitted and taught orally, not in writing. Even if individual rabbis had private copies or notes of texts, which seems likely to me personally, and even if these copies or notes were inscribed in primitive codices called pinkasim, from the Greek pinakes for tablets, those texts had no official literary status and are never cited or mentioned in rabbinic literature. So the question as to why Jews did not take up the writing platform is somewhat moot. They may have, they simply did not write about it. On the other hand, there may have been another more polemical rationale behind the Jews' avoidance of the Codex. We know that the first group to take up the Codex form as a writing platform, as a group for their own literary works, specifically the Gospels and the Pauline Epistles, were early Greek-speaking Christians. And it's very possible that they these early Greek-speaking Christians wrote their texts in codices precisely in order to differentiate themselves from Jews with their Torah scrolls. Now, once Christians had appropriated the codex, the rabbis may have avoided it in reaction to the Christian use. In this light, it may be a telling fact that when Jews finally did take up the codex, it was only after they were firmly ensconced in the Islamic world following the conquest of the Near East by Islam in the late 7th and 8th century, when they now found themselves living in a new social and cultural context in which the Christian appropriation of the Codex had lost its practical relevance and negative significance, which is exactly when the Washington Pentateuch, as we've seen, was produced. So this then is the first reason for the importance of these early Hebrew biblical codices, they were simply the first Jewish codices, the first Jewish books. The second reason for their importance is for the place they hold in the history of the biblical text. Bible scholars generally consider these codices as our primary evidence for the final stage of the stabilization of the biblical text as we more or less know it today. Since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, if not even before that, it's been clear to Bible scholars that in the last centuries before the Common Era, until the time of the destruction of the Temple in 70 CE, the biblical text circulated and was transmitted in several different text types or versions. These separate versions included the Proto-Samaritan text, which looks forward to the text finally preserved in the Samaritan Pentateuch, 
Second, the putative Hebrew text that served as the basis for the old Greek translation of the Bible, known as the Septuagint, and still other text traditions unique to Qumran that appear to have been specific to the scribes of the Dead Sea community. And finally, the tradition known as the Proto-Masoretic tradition, which anticipates the Hebrew text found in our biblical codices, and that was later accepted as authoritative by medieval rabbinic tradition. Among the thousands of Qumran fragments, the Proto-Masoretic texts are, are already the most common ones, but the overall state of the biblical text was still quite fluid and pluralistic with multiple coexisting traditions. That changed over the following hundred years. The biblical manuscripts found in the Judean desert that were left behind after the failed Bar Kokhba revolt in 135 CE, 65 years after the destruction of the temple and of Qumran, all reflect the proto-Masoretic tradition. Even though this may only indicate that the Bar Kokhba rebels followed the rabbinic authorities in Jerusalem who promulgated the proto-Masoretic text, as some scholars have argued, it nonetheless suggests that over the course of 100 years, a gradual process took place through which the Proto-Masoretic text's rival traditions gradually disappeared, leaving the Proto-Masoretic tradition as a sole surviving textual tradition. As the Samaritans split off from rabbinic Jews to become a fully separate religious group, their biblical text tradition also became a fully distinct one, written in a different script, now known as Paleo-Hebrew, which is to be distinguished from the so-called Assyrian script that the rabbis mandated as the only permissible script for writing a Torah scroll. As Christianity and Judaism parted ways, and Christianity appropriated the Greek Bible as their Old Testament, the proto-Septuagint Hebrew text also vanished from Jewish circles. And as the Qumran community was destroyed in the course of the war against Rome that culminated in the temple's destruction, so too were their scribal traditions. There is, however, no reason to believe that there was a programmatic or deliberate decision to establish the proto-Masoretic text as the correct Hebrew text, no moment or event of canonization, as it were. The proto-Masoretic text simply survived. And even within the proto-Masoretic tradition, there still remain differences in pronunciation, orthography, and syntactical constructions, as the evidence of rabbinic literature in the Talmud and the Midrasha collections indicates. Invariably, over time, there also developed increasing disparities between the scribal or writing tradition and the reading tradition that governed the correct pronunciation, and even more importantly, the chanting of the biblical text in the synagogue. These differences were in turn exasperated, exacerbated by local differences in practice between the two main center, centers of ancient Judaism in Palestine and Babylonia, differences that often express themselves in fierce rivalries. By the seventh century, it appears that a need to standardize and harmonize these differences and thereby establish the correct text of the Bible along with its correct pronunciation was felt throughout the entire Jewish world. And by this point in the late seventh century, around 90% of the world's Jewish population lived within the orbit of the expanding Islamic empire. And it's worth noting that comparable efforts to stabilize the text of the Quran were also underway. The Hebrew term for a codex is mutzchaf, a term borrowed from the Arabic. And as we'll see, the early Jewish biblical codices were strongly influenced by the contemporaneous Islamic book, particularly Qurans. Now this project of stabilization of the biblical text is the beginning of the Mesorah. The Mesora is a vast system of annotations that mark and enumerate every unusual or ex exceptional textual, orthographic, phonetic, and syntactic phenomenon in the Hebrew Bible. Every time a word is spelled unusually, a word itself is unusual, a construction is unusual, the Mesora is interested in it and wants to count the number of times it occurs in the Bible. It's most interested if it's the only time that it occurs, if it only occurs once. 
Now, the term Masorah is close to the word Masoret, tradition, and is often translated in that way. But the actual term Masorah appears to be connected to a root meaning to count, which is, in fact, closer to the Masorah's enumerative character. We know very little about the history of the Masorah or about its authors and creators, the Baalei HaMasorah, the masters of Masorah, or Masoretes, as they're known to scholars in America today. To be sure, interesting and unusual features of the biblical text go back as early as the biblical text itself. And rabbinic literature is replete with comments and reflections upon unusual phenomena in the Bible. But the first actual evidence we have for the system or corpus no known as the Masorah is found only in the early biblical codices, like the Washington Pentateuch. It appears that by the 8th century, there existed three distinct schools of Masorah, in Babylonia, Palestine, and in the city of Tiberias. While the Babylonian school initially seems to have been the dominant one, Tiberias enjoyed a special reputation for the purity of the Hebrew spoken by its inhabitants, and its Masoretic school eventually won out over its rivals. And within the Tiberian school, in turn, there existed two rival traditions as well, each one associated with a leading family of Tiberian Masoretes, the Ben Naphtalis and the Ben Ashers. And the traditions of the Ben Ashers eventually won out. And because history always belongs to the victors, the only traditions about which we have substantial knowledge are those of the Tiberian Center and specifically those of the Ben Asher family in Tiberias. Now exactly why the Ben Asher's triumph is not fully understood, but it may have something to do with the page layout we saw er earlier and now you see on the screen again. As I noted earlier, the same page layout appears in all the great Masoretic codices. Aleppo, Leningrad, and the Washington Pentateuch. In order fully to appreciate the significance of this page, and particularly its layout, we must look at its predecessor, the Sefer Torah or Torah scroll. Now in modern Hebrew, the word Sefer means a book. But in biblical Hebrew, Sefer can refer to any written communication. And the original Sefer was the Sefer Torah which we know today as the monumental Torah scroll you see on the screen. But every book has a history, and the Sefer Torah is no exception. Before the Sefer Torah existed as a monumental scroll containing the entire Pentateuch, all five books of Moses, it was five separate smaller scrolls, each one containing one of the five books of Moses. These smaller scrolls were known as Chomashim or Chumashim, and together they comprised the Chamisha Chomshe Torah, the five Chomashim of the Torah. These smaller scrolls were very usable scrolls for reading or studying. They were quite portable, they could be held in one's hand, and in size they were very much like most scrolls in the Mediterranean and Near Eastern worlds. By the late third century, for reasons that are not entirely clear, the rabbis eventually forbade writing any type of Torah scroll other than one containing the entirety of the Pentateuch. Furthermore, they prescribed specific laws governing every aspect of the production of a kosher Torah scroll, from the type of parchment used, the type of thread used to sew together the skins, the type of ink to write in, the number of lines in a column, the correct script to be used, the different rules for spacing lines, separating sections, and numerous other prescriptions. And formulating these laws, and specifically the prohibition against writing any scroll smaller than a complete Pentateuch, the rabbis essentially transformed the Sefer Torah from what it had been in the smaller one book, Chumashim. They turned it from being a book in any ordinary sense of the term, that is to say, a medium for reading and study, into something very different, a ritual artifact, good only for a single purpose, to be chanted in the synagogue as part of the liturgical service. Now for us, the most important of the rules the rabbis enacted was a prohibition against writing anything in the Torah scroll other than the consonantal text of the Torah. Hebrew is a consonantal language. With the exception of a few consonantal vowels, there are vowels that you can actually write as 
consonants, letters, like a vav or a yud, but usually only the consonants are usually written, and a reader is expected to know the appropriate vowels so as to pronounce a word correctly. In the rabbinic period, vocalization marks didn't even exist. Now, one assumes that during the period when the biblical text was originally inscribed, its correct pronunciation was not problematic. But by the rabbinic period, centuries later, this was no longer true. The Hebrew language had changed enormously. Moreover, the Bible's Hebrew is often archaic and simply difficult. And in addition, Hebrew was no longer the lingua franca people spoke on a daily basis. As a result, the correct pronunciation, let alone the chanting of the biblical text, was no longer a simple, let alone a transparent task. And in the rabbinic period, there was, in fact, only one way to learn to read and chant the text correctly. One had to memorize it from hearing a master or teacher chant the Torah correctly. Essentially, this was no different than the way a bar mitzvah boy or a bat mitzvah girl learns to chant their Torah portion today. During the rabbinic period, everyone had to do the same thing. Now, in the image on the screen, I've juxtaposed two columns of the same text, this is Genesis 22, one as it's written in a Torah scroll, the other as it's found in a contemporary printed Bible, in order to show you graphically the challenge of reading a column in a Torah scroll. The right-hand column has vowels beneath the letters, as you can see, and cantillation and accentuation marks the ta'amim above them. But in the left-hand column, from the Torah scroll, there are neither vowels nor ta'amim. The only textual markings in the Torah scroll are the so-called tagim, the whisker-like hairs that sprout from the roofs of some letters, but these are merely scribal flourishes. Having seen this, we can now appreciate how innovative the page of the early biblical codex was. As you see, the overall layout of the page replicates the column structure on a sheet of a Torah scroll, as does the large black square script in which the text is inscribed. But unlike a Sefer Torah, the Codex's Hebrew text is vowelized and written with the ta'amim, the accentuation marks, which also serve as the musical indications for chanting the text liturgically. In this sense, it's the predecessor of the printed page we saw on the previous slide. Most important for us, however, the page also contains the Mesora, which is found on the page in two forms the first in the spare form of intercolumn abbreviations, often consisting of one letter, the second in the two line, and the second way in the two line notes on the very top and the very bottom of the page. The first way between the columns is called the Mesora Parva or Mesora Katana, the little Mesora. The, the other one is called the Mesora Magna or Mesora Gedola, the larger big Mesora. Now in this slide, I've color-coded uh, the different types of notes on, of the Mesora Parva on the page. Most of the notes consist of a single Hebrew letter, as you can see, an Aleph, a Bet, a Gimel, and so on, whose numerical value, one, two, three, signifies how many times that word or phrase or unusual construction occurs in the entire biblical text. As I said a little while ago, that's mainly what the Mesora does. And there are literally thousands of such notes. There's other notes and spaces between the columns that tell you when to pronounce the text differently than the way it's written, or not to read a specific word at all. And there's about 1,500 notes of this sort. But altogether, all these enumerative and textual annotations are considered by most scholars to have been the last stage in the stabilization of the biblical text otherwise known as the Mesoratic text of the Bible. Now, the Mesora Magna, found in the two upper and lower micrographic lines of the page, is essentially an expansion and elaboration of the Mesora Parva. For example, where Mesora Parva will simply note that a given word appears four times in the Bible, Mesora Magna will list the verses, usually by their initial words, since chapter and verse numberings didn't exist in the Masoretic period. Other types of Mesora Magna notes collate lists of verses or phrases or constructions which have some kind of unusual feature, and some of these notes are even witticisms intended to help students or scribes remember the odd phenomena. In its totality, the Mesora numbers thousands of annotations, 
It's a vast, almost utopian project, a kind of cross between bookkeeping and connoisseurship, as though every biblical detail, every singularity and eccentricity were a gem to be cataloged and categorized. And it's a fairly insane project. <laughs> but what was its purpose? It's unimaginably ambitious. What purpose could it have served? Now, the traditional explanation is that it was meant to ensure the accurate transmission of the biblical text. And there's certainly truth in this reason. But the overall vastness of the initiative seems somewhat excessive if accurate transmission was its sole purpose. It would have been more efficient just to have a model text. And this rationale is also belied by the fact that with the exception of the Aleppo Codex, all the surviving Masoretic Codices contain huge numbers of errors, and they almost never agree with each other. Other scholars have suggested that the Masora was an early commentary or a kind of database for information to be used in biblical commentaries or for constructing a biblical grammar. And here, too, there's probably truth in all these suggestions. But the motivation behind the Masora may lie in a somewhat different direction. The history of Judaism as a living religion can be viewed as a competition between revelation and tradition, between, between scripture, the revealed truth as embodied in the Hebrew Bible, and the oral law, the repository of rabbinic exposition of the law, as eventually crystallized in the Talmud. Now, each side has had its moments of triumph. And in the Middle Ages, the Talmudists eventually gained the upper hand. But the rivalry between the two, let's call them the scripturalists and the Talmudists, has never ceased. We can call the Masora the scripturalist Talmud. The Masoretes immersed themselves in the words of the Bible and invested their intellectual energies in collating and harmonizing all the different divergent textual traditions of the Bible with the same fervor the rabbis invested in their study of the oral traditions of the Talmudic oral corpus of tradition. The Masorah really was their Talmud. Now, the particular page format characteristic of these early biblical codices was the creation of the Tiberian school. The, pa the Babylonian and the Palestinian Masoretic schools generally inscribed their annotations, first of all, in separate booklets. They also devised a different system of notation for marking vowels. It was supralinear, above the letters, not below it. And here you see examples of both types which did not survive in Jewish tradition. To the best of our knowledge, the Tiberian school was the first to put all, wait, that's, I don't want that scribe, to put all three elements found on this page, the vocalization marks, the accentuation and cantillation notes, and the Masora on the same page. And this may be the very reason why they were able to triumph over their rival schools and eventually establish their Masoretic tradition as the accepted one. The great Israeli codicologist Malachi Ben Arye has suggested that the Ben Asher's, the leading Tiberian family of Masoretes, were the first to fully understand the utility of the codex as a writing platform and to exploit its utility through the invention of this page format. They literally invented this page. The many leaves from lost codices of the Ben Asher family discovered over the past 50 years in Russian collections suggest that the Ben Asher's flooded the market with codices containing their Masoretic traditions. These codices, like the Washington Codex, in other words, were the first publishing success in Jewish history. So these codices mark not only the final stages in the history of the, of the stabilization of the biblical text, they also mark a watershed moment in the history of Jewish reading practice, specifically in the history of Jewish biblical interpretation. So long as the Torah was written only in monumental scrolls like a Sefer Torah, its students, as we've seen, knew the Bible mainly through memorizing its words from having heard it chanted either in the synagogue or in academic settings. With the adaption of the codex, this changed. 
students began to read the Bible, to actually read it with their eyes, and to study Bible as a text learned visually, not orally, A-U-R-A-L-L-Y. The Masoretes themselves must have acquired their knowledge of the Bible through reading it. The Masoretes' obsessive attention to defective and full words, where consonantal vowels are either used or not used, is inconceivable if one does not assume that its compilers were looking at the biblical text. While I don't have time in this lecture to demonstrate this to you with even one short example, the shift in reading practice from oral, A-U-R-A-L, knowledge of the Bible to visual knowledge had enormous consequences for the history of Jewish biblical exegesis, how the Bible came to be interpreted by Jews. Indeed, the changes from rabbinic to medieval Jewish biblical exegesis are incomprehensible without understanding this shift in reading practice. But for us, what's most important to emphasize is the visual dimension of these early biblical codices. In addition to being the first codices produced by Jews, and on top of their importance for the history of the biblical text, these codices are also our very first sources for Jewish art after the ancient period. There are first examples of Jewish book art, which is again to emphasize that these books were meant to be looked at and appreciated visually for their beauty and aesthetic appearance. As we'll see immediately, the Washington Pentateuch has some very interesting decorations on its pages. But the most dramatic examples of Jewish book art in the early Masoretic codices are those found on the so-called carpet pages, which I wanted to show you first. They're called carpet pages because their designs resemble those found on oriental carpets. And they're found in several of the surviving early codices, but most famously in the Leningrad Codex. And they're typically found at the beginning and end of the codices so that they provide a kind of interior binding for the book. This page is one of several colophon pages in the Leningrad Codex. Uh, the Star of David in the middle of the page is actually, it's not a Star of David, it's the Seal of Solomon, which is a very common magical and folk art motif found throughout the ancient and early Near East. It only becomes the Star of David much, much later in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, when it's sort of appropriated by Jews. But for us, the important thing is that inside the design, the scribe Samuel ben Boya has inscribed his name and the name of the Bible's patron. In other words, he's used it as a frame for a colophon. But the design on this page directly reflects the influence of contemporary Islamic Quran manuscripts as you can see here. This is a very similar carpet page from a contemporary Quran written in Iraq around the year 1000. And here you can see the two, no. Here you can see the two pages juxtaposed. In both, the design in the center is framed within overlapping squares, which are in turn enveloped within surrounding circles. Now, the central designs in the two images are, of course, different. The biblical codex has a seal of Solomon. The Quran has a scalloped double circle or floret. And most important, the Masoretic carpet page exhibits a feature found in no other book, namely the use of micrography, miniature writing, as the very stuff, the basis, for the geometric designs on the pages. Now, such micrography may be a uniquely Jewish art form. Some Jewish art historians have claimed it's the only truly native Jewish art form. And its invention appears to have accompanied the adaption of the codex as a book form in Jewish culture. But the contents of the micrography is a series of verses from a Masoretic list. So here, the Masora has been turned into art of visual design. So these carpet pages as a whole are an amalgamation of Islamically derived designs and Jewish inscriptional material that has been enlisted to create the designs. It's a striking example of what one scholar has called inward acculturation, whereby a minority population adopts, appropriates a practice of the majority culture, but transforms it in its own image so as to make it into its own property. Now, as in classical Islamic art, the designs in the codices are nearly all aniconic, avoiding any direct representation of humans or even animals. It's virtually all geometric, architectural, or floral. 
And in Islam, there were theological reasons for this aversion to representational art. Jews living in the Islamic realm did not necessarily accept the theology behind the aversion, but they did adopt the stylistic preference. All the features I've mentioned thus far, the overall page layout of these codices in two or three columns with the Masora magnet at the top and the bottom of the writing grid and the Masora parva written in abbreviations and single letters between the columns, the Nikud, the pointing of vowels, the vocalization marks and the tamim, the accentuation and cantillation notes, all these features are common to all the early biblical codices written in the 10th and 11th centuries. But as anyone who has worked with books knows, books are like people. They share common features, but each one is also different. Moreover, if books are like people, they have lives. And those lives have stories that begin with their creation and extend into their afterlives with the tales of their owners and even their readers. And those lives are always different. And if all books are like people and have lives, Jewish books are like Jews and they have Jewish lives. And the Washington Pentateuch is no different. Now we can begin to describe the Washington Pentateuch's life with the fact mentioned at the beginning of this talk that the codex as it now exists is a composite volume consisting of three separate parts. The complete book has 247 folios. Now the main part of the book, which I'm calling part two, consists of 221 of those 247 folios, and it's the Pentateuch that I've been discussing until now. It has no colophon or other explicit indication of its state or places of composition, but paleographers have dated it to approximately the year 1000 on the basis of its script and on account of certain scribal practices associated with another biblical manuscript composed around the same time that I'll come to very shortly. In any case, this part of the codex, its main part, goes from Genesis 4, verse 8b, through Deuteronomy 29, 12. And on the bottom left, you can see folio 4r, and next to it, on the right, folio 237b. Now, the first part of the codex consists of the first two folios, which are from a different unidentified work, and they go from from folios 2v through 3v, namely from Genesis 1-1 through Genesis 2 verse 5b. And on the slide, you can see the very beginning of Genesis, first verse. The codex is missing two folios, which presumably contain Genesis 2-6 through 4-8a, where the main part of the codex now begins. I should also mention that the main section, part two, is also missing a few folios from the Book of Numbers. I have no idea why they left out pages, those pages. It's sort of a mystery. Um, now, while the two opening folios, let's see. Uh, now, while the two opening, is this two, no. Yeah, while the two opening folios are not dated, you can see that they're quite similar to the main part of the codex and script, and are presumably both fairly, the first two folios are also fairly early from roughly the same period. The third and final part of the codex, um, folios 238R through 245R conclude the Pentateuch and go from Deuteronomy 29.8b, through 3412, the end of the Pentateuch. The first four verses of this section also overlap with the last four verses from the main preceding section, which concludes with 2912. This final section of the Codex is clearly from a very different scribe than the main section, as you can see by comparing the hands of the two different scribes. The margins, first of all, on the pages of the final section, that's what you see on the right, have all been cut down, trimmed, with the effect that much of the Masora Magna has been cut off in order to make the page fit the dimensions of the main section in the codex. The script is obviously from a different hand. It's much less accomplished. It's much less beautiful. But this section of the codex, these last pages, does, however, have a colophon. I 
Joseph Bar Jacob from the peak of the West, nobody knows where this is, wrote these five books of this Torah with the help of the good God in the month of Marcheshvan. We're right now in the month of Marcheshvan. In the year 4902, since the creation of the world, 1141 in the Common Era, in the city of Noamon, that is Thebes in Egypt. So, if the main section of the Codex is from around the year 1000, this final section is roughly 150 years later. And then finally, at the very conclusion of the Pentateuch on three pages, one and a half folios, there are Masoretic lists with decorations. They, oh no, previous slide. There are uh, Masoretic lists with decorations. They look like golden flower pots atop each column. These pages are part of that final section, the added section. And then finally, on the two sides of the very last folio on the codex, each one contains a carpet page uh, with, micro design, with micrographic designs containing Masoretic notes. And this last folio is probably part of the main early part of the codex. Now these early biblical codices were typically collaborative works. One scribe wrote the Continental Text, another scribe, usually a professional Masoretic, wrote the Misora, and sometimes a third scribe added the vowels into Amim, the accentuation and cantillation marks, although it was not uncommon for the Masoretic to do this as well. In the case of the main text of the Washington Pentateuch, we have no idea as to the precise identity of any of these figures, but it's clear that the scribe was a professional and a very gifted scribe. Now, we tend to think of scribes as mere copyists, but in fact, professional serious scribes, and certainly great serious scribes, even when they're copying a Bible and seeking to transmit the text as accurately as possible, which is, in the end, the whole point of the project of copying a Torah, even these scribes are not merely automatic copyists. They copy but they nonetheless find ways to express their individuality and their creativity and to leave their personal imprint, their signatures, as it were, upon the manuscript. Now, there's many ways in which they do this. The most obvious is through the magnificent calligraphic nature of the script. Even if it's hard for us to distinguish between the different scripts, every scribe's script is different in some way. This page on the screen you see here is from the page of the Decalogue, the end of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. And in the right-hand column, you can see the special line layout for the last seven commandments. The page as a whole commands the, re the reader's attention, just like the commandments. And these, its attention begins with its magisterial hand. Its monumental nature, the confident sweep of the strokes with their slightly arabicized scimitar-like legs and their gir giraffe-like necks of the lamids, all testify to a mature, fully developed writing style. So too, the overall page layout with its symmetry and transparency, the different size scripts for the different texts on the page to communicate the hierarchy of their importance, the various paratextual signs like parasha markers, as one can see on this page for Parashat Vayakil, beginning with Exodus 34. Up on the upper right-hand side, that marks the beginning of a weekly reading. That pay, people read that sign up there, that's the beginning of a weekly reading. That's how to be used in the synagogue. Um, uh, while the basic script type and the overall page features are common to all the early Masoretic codices, each one has distinctive features which point to their individual scribes. And in the case of the Washington Pentateuch, we can point to two clear examples of how the Washington Pentateuch's main scribe expressed his individuality. Now, the first one comes in the form of what codicologists, that is say, scholars who study the composition and production of codices, call line fillers. To put it bluntly, Hebrew scribes are obsessed with justification of the left-hand margin. Everybody has their vices. Part of this obsession has to do with a desire to maintain a regular and consistent length of, for all lines. Manuscripts were ruled both horizontally and vertically, and the vertical rulings determined the width of columns. 
Now, this concern with maintaining left justifications uh, began with Torah scrolls. Rabbinic law requires it. But it also carried over into codices. But early on, scribes realized that the specific technique used to achieve left justification also gave them a real path to express creativity. And on this page, you can see what is probably the most common the most common way in which the Washington Pentateuch scribe filled in his left margin, he filled them in with mems. That's why I circled them, which are basically meaningless letters. But what do they do? They fill empty space. And some of them are big, some of them are small. Most often he uses a single mem, but if he needs to, he uses a double mem. And in a few cases, he uses a single dot or brief downstrokes that look like the letter Yud. But they have nothing to do with anything. These are nonsense letters, and they're not the only ones, okay? On this page, you can see still, no. On this page, you can still see uh, others. On the bottom left-hand side, you can see how he uses the two minuscule letters, Vav and Yudch, which do, don't correspond to anything in the text. While on the lower right-hand margin, there's two instances where he creates a nonsense character out of what is essentially one half of the letter Shin. That's what I pointed out here. This is half of a shin. Um, he's very inventive in this way. And on this next page, I've collected a bunch of examples from different pages of various nonsense characters and letters that he uses as fillers just to give you a sense of the range of his creativity and imagination. You won't find this in another manuscript. This is his signature. Now, in the later mi Middle Ages, these this practice of using line fillers will develop as one of the main avenues for scribal creativity. But this manuscript is one of the earliest examples that I know of really to show its use. Um, later on, certain scribes will develop unique line fillers, all their own, that actually serve as real signatures, so singular that you can actually identify manuscripts solely on their basis. They don't have colophons, they don't have any dates. You can tell they were written by a certain scribe because they have a certain line filler. Um, it's really quite remarkable. Now, the second way in which our scribe personalized our codex, as it were, was in an unusual practice he employed in ending biblical books. Um, he wrote the final seven or eight words in a single column with one word per line with multiple spacing between each line. This is the end of Genesis. They're describing how they put Joseph into, uh, how they embalmed him and put him into a, uh, a uh, casket in Egypt. It's a hair side of this parchment, so it's a little difficult to read. But here's the end of Exodus, which is a lot clearer. <laughs> Uh, which is much clearer to read. But he simply wrote one word per column, one word per line, in full, and then left an empty column to signify the fact that this was the end of a book. Now, exactly why he chose to end each chapter in this way is unknown. There's no known precedent for the practice, but it's another. But there is one other important early codex, which also uses the same technique for signaling the end of a biblical code book, and that is the Cairo Prophets Codex, Now, which I'll come to in a second. While it's likely that the Masoret of our codex was different than its main scribe, though it's not impossible that they were the same person, the Misora, Gedola, and Magda in the main section is also distinctive. For one thing, it's one of our earliest examples of a special type of Masoretic note called Mesorah Mitzarefet, or cumulative or collative Mesorah, which lists groups of unrelated words, phrases, or verses that nonetheless share a common exceptional lexical feature. For example, the list you see at the top collects words that all end with the same final syllable each of which is a hapax legomenon, namely a unique word in the Bible. And above and below that word, arranged in a kind of abstract diamond-like design, are other words from the Bible in which the words, from the verses in which the words appear. And here again, in a chain of pyramid-like designs, are a series of 
hapax legomenons of words, all of which have the root shin, lamed, chet. Now, these designs were obviously meant to be seen. As I said, these are books that are visual. Now, significantly, the one other manuscript that has similar Mesorah Mitzarefid notes in comparable designs is this Cairo Prophets Codex that I mentioned a second ago as being the only other manuscript that also ends biblical books with single word columns as we've seen. Now here are, two exam here are examples of two pages from the Cairo Codex. The resemblance between the two codices, the Cairo Prophets Codex and the Washington Pentateuch, is also only bolstered by the following striking pages in the Washington Pentateuch. These are the pages you see all over this exhibit. These pages contain the Song at the Sea in Exodus 15, which are laid out in the pattern known as Ariach al Gabe Levena, a small brick atop a large brick, a traditional line layout that goes back to the Torah scroll. On the right hand page, containing the beginning of the song, there are various pyramid, pyramid like, and triangular designs containing Mesorah Mitzarefit. And on the left hand page, the Mesorah literally forms a wall or fence around the biblical text, which may be a kind of double visual pun. First, on the verse in Exodus 14.29, it could be a pun. Uh, verse 14.29 describes how the Israelites walk through the Red Sea with the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. And here, this could be a pun on that verse with a wall on their right and on their left. But even more, it might be a pun on a statement in Mishnah Avod 313, Masoret Syug the Torah. The Masoret or tradition is a fence around the Torah, which is the name of our exhibit, which the Masoretes themselves interpreted as meaning the Masorah is, or misinterpreted as meaning, the Masorah is a fence around the Torah. And here on this page, the Masorah is literally a fence around the Torah. Now, the Cairo Prophets Codex, and I mean, you see between the right-hand page and if you go back to this, you can see how similar those, that also has the same sort of pyramid-like designs and so on. Now, the Cairo Prophets Codex is a very, is a famously controversial book. It was owned by the Karite Synagogue of Musa Dari. Its current whereabouts are unknown. It sort of has vanished. But the Codex, which contains the books of the prophets, has a colophon stating that it was written by no one less than Moshe ben Asher, the founder of the ben Asher family, in the year 825 years after the destruction of the temple, namely in the year 895 CE. This would make the Codex the earliest surviving Hebrew Codex in the world. The Aleppo Codex is from 930 CE you know, 35 years later. But many scholars have questioned the authenticity of the colophon, and radiocarbon dating of the parchment has also indicated that the most likely date of the codex is between 990 CE and 1060. It appears, then, that the existing codex is a copy of a codex originally copied by Moshe ben Asher, and that the scribe who later copied that codex also copied the colophon from the original manuscript. Now, there's no reason to assume that the same scribe copied both the Cairo Codex and the Washington Pentateuch, but the strong similarities between the two codices, the unusual book endings, the Masorah Mitzarefet, the similar geometric designs, they all suggest that the two manuscripts derive from the same scribal tradition and historical moment, and given that likelihood, the main section of the Washington Pentateuch likely dates from around the year 1000 CE, which is how we actually arrived at the date for it, for this exhibit. Now, what happened to the Codex, its life, after its composition around the year 1000, or when the initial folios from the Book of Genesis or the final choirs from the Book of Deuteronomy were lost, or when exactly they were replaced, all this is unknown. Our next indication about the life of the Codex 
comes on the same page as the colophon that we saw earlier for the third section of the codex, and a partially defaced dedicatory, dedicatory note in the upper middle part of the page between the end of Deuteronomy on the right-hand side and the colophon column on the left-hand side, in the middle there, where above that empty space. And according to this, it's a really grotesquely florid dedication. In the year 1835, the Karite community of the city of Eupatoria, today Guzlov, in Crimea, which once was in Ukraine, today it's in Russia, dedicated this ancient manuscript, dating it from 1142, which is not very much off from its real date, 1141, and surviving among them from their ancestors, they say, for 693 years. They dedicate it to a great man, they write, a servant of God, his faithful servant, shepherd, the teacher of God's law, a messenger of God, or his angel, the words messenger and angel are the same word, who came to visit them in their city so that he would remember and not forget them. That's why they dedicated and gave him the book as a gift. Now, unhappily, the name of the dedicatee has been defaced, but according to a note by the great 19th century Russian Orientalist and bibliographer David Schwolson, the recipient, the guy who got this gift, was none other than Gabriel, the Archbishop of Kharsan. Gabriel may have been an angel, too, but he definitely was an archbishop. Now, Schulzen also tells us that subsequently, Gabriel gave the manuscript to the Theological Academy of the Russian Church in Zagorsk, near Moscow, which is where he saw it. And very clearly, the final Deuteronomy section to which the dedication refers had been added by this time. Indeed, the Karaites didn't even seem to recognize that the manuscript was a composite one of different works. At some point, again, we don't exactly know how or when, the Codex left Russia, and it seemed to have reached Jerusalem, where it was owned by a private collector in Jerusalem, and then it was sold and it was bought by a private collector in London who gave it to a book dealer who saw, I mean, it, 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 was, it, was, it, it owned, was owned by a collector in Jerusalem who then sold it to another collector in London who in turn has now sold it to the Museum of the Bible. And so ends the life of the Washington Pentateuch up to this point but who knows what its future may be. Perhaps its missing sections may turn up, or we may learn the identity of its scribe or its Masoret, or how it got to Russia, to Crimea, or how it left Crimea and got to Jerusalem. Who knows? For now, as the rabbis say, go, look, study it. Thank you. <laughs>